Hey, tailgaters! Ross of the Pigskin Tales Podcast here. Feel that sizzle in the air? That's not just your grill firing up, it's the thrill of upcoming college football season. Get your game day gear ready with Homefield, the premium collegiate apparel brand out of Indianapolis. They're serving up super comfortable, officially licensed apparel with unique vintage designs from over 150 colleges. It's like a buffet of team spirit. Just like your secret barbecue sauce, Homefield digs deep for flavor, unearthing unique logos and mascots from each school's history. You'll be decked out in a piece of nostalgia, ready to be the MVP of your tailgate party. So fire up the grill, chill the drinks, and visit homefieldapparel.com. Again, that's homefieldapparel.com. Welcome to Football is Family, a podcast dedicated to the fan and fan experience. My name is Jeremy McFarland, and I want to look at the positive behind what makes football so enjoyable to watch and follow. I want to know why you are a fan of your team, of a player, or an era of football. Whether the pros, college, or high school, I want to hear and share your stories and your love for the game. If you want to be part of this podcast, please message me on Twitter at Jeremy underscore McFarlane, or on Facebook at the Football is Family Facebook page. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Football is Family podcast. And this week being Super Bowl week, I've wanted to try to do an episode a day about the Super Bowl and about uh, things that are related to the Super Bowl yesterday. If you go back onto football's family, like and follow, uh, give me a rating. Let me know where I can improve on. Let me know what I'm doing right. But uh, yesterday's episode was on the, the top Super Bowl rings. I think I picked out 14 of them and, and, and I gave reasons why. And I left a link in the description uh, of the, the episode's description so you can find and look at the rings yourself. They're, they're all great. Don't get me wrong, but I found 14 that I that me personally like better than the other than the other ones. Uh, today, I want to talk about individual Super Bowl performances and the top individual Super Bowl performances. And and I'm not just talking about one thing or one event. Um, you know, with Mike Jones, even though he did tackle Kevin Dyson one yard short, that was an incredible event. Malcolm Butler intercepting Russell Wilson at the last second. It's, they should have ran the ball, you know, but Malcolm Butler intercepting uh, Russell Wilson to, to Russell Wilson to submit that Super Bowl is a great individual play. <clears throat> I am talking about overall in one game, uh, and talking about how those players made a big difference in in the game. And in, in particular, I'm talking about stats and I'm talking about big, big situations. So let's start out. And again, if you uh, have somebody to add to this or you think I'm wrong on it, please message me at Jeremy underscore McFarland at Twitter and or follow us on the uh, Football Family Facebook page. And and let me know uh, what I could add. Maybe I can add it tomorrow or the next day to the next podcast that are coming up. Uh, Super Bowl one had an individual individual that doesn't really get a lot of um, publicity, and that is Mac uh, Max McGee. He played uh, wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers, and in fact, he had played twelve years at this time, and he thought he was not going to play in the Super Bowl. He was getting older. In fact, in 66, he caught only th- uh, four passes in 12 games. But the starting wide receiver was injured for the Green Bay Packers. I believe his name was Boyd Dower. So Max McGee didn't even think about that. That night he got drunk. <laughs> the night before he got drunk. And he was playing, he was playing uh, basically hungover. He caught seven passes for 138 yards, two touchdowns, including the first touchdown in Super Bowl history. 
Max McGee, a guy who thought that he was not going to play, ended up being one of the uh, – well, ended up setting the bar pretty high for wide receivers. What do you think about this? Percy Harvin. Percy Harvin in the Super Bowl against the Broncos, the CLC Hawks versus the Broncos, only had the ball in his hands four times, but all of it added up to 137 yards. He ran the ball twice for 45 yards, caught a five-yard uh, pass, and returned a second-half kickoff 87 yards for a touchdown. Now, that is incredible. He made the most of four touches. Desmond Howard, how many of you remember Desmond Howard? Desmond Howard is a guy that won the won the MVP for the Super Bowl. Uh, he is ma- mainly known for his time with Michigan, but he did play Michigan Wolverines, but he did play in the Super Bowl with the Green Bay Packers. He set a he tied a Super Bowl record with a combined 244 yards on punt and kickoff returns in the Super Bowl. He is the first and only special teams player to be named the MVP of the Super Bowl. Can you imagine that? Now, I remember watching this game. Desmond Howard went off. He went off. One of them was a third-quarter kickoff return, 99 yards for a touchdown. He made uh, he made a scene in that game. He went off. Uh, probably the Super Bowl MVP would have been Brett Favre or Reggie White. But Desmond Howard did what he did, and that was incredible to watch him play that game. One of the ones that I do remember, and I didn't know the backstory behind this, was running back Timmy Smith in Super Bowl XXII. This is the first Super Bowl that I actually remember watching. I think I might have watched the one before that, uh, but this right here was probably the one I remember watching. And I remember pulling – you know, I didn't have a team in the the game, but I picked the Broncos to, to win it, and they were winning up until the second quarter. And after that, the Washington Redskins behind Doug Williams, by the way, he had a great performance too. But most people don't really remember him compared to Timmy Smith. Timmy Smith kind of fell off the side of the world. I mean, just after this game, you didn't hear about him. Timmy Smith wasn't told until the day of or the night before that he was going to start in the Super Bowl. He wasn't told. Joe Gibbs remembered and thought and said, you know what, he is going to go crazy. He's going to be so anxious if we told him way before that he's starting. And he'd tell him till he was a starter, until basically the day of the Super Bowl, if not the night before the Super Bowl. He ran the ball 22 times for a record 204 yards and two touchdowns. So much for jitters. 22 times for 204 yards and two touchdowns touchdowns that's incredible during the regular season this website i'm looking at here at bleacherreport.com says that he ran uh he played only seven games rushed for a total of 126 yards on 29 attempts but he ran for 204 yards in the super bowl and i remember that he, he did amazing he absolutely did amazing um when you talk about performances, though, and again, this kind of hurts me to say this, most performances that we remember revolve around the quarterback. And the reason I say it hurt, I like Kurt Warner. I think he was a good quarterback. I think he was one of the better ones that we've ever seen. But the Super Bowl that we remember him from, you know, he did play for Arizona, and they probably should have won that Super Bowl. But the one that we remember him most about is the one against the Titans in Super Bowl 34. Um the Titans pretty much kept their, uh, you know, they kept the running game in check, even though they had Marshall Falk, they kept the running game in check. What the Titans couldn't do is keep Kurt Warner in check. Listen to this. He ended up throwing for 414 yards in the Super Bowl and a pair of touchdowns. The last one, or the second touchdown, I should say, that he threw was a 73-yard touchdown throw to Isaac Bruce with 154 left on the clock. 414 yards. That's what made this team, and they call this the greatest show on turf, that's what made that particular 
St. Louis Rams team so insanely hard to, to guard against. You had Kurt Warner, who could do just about anything with the ball. You had Marshall Falk, who was a magician. He could kick the ball. He could return kickoffs. He could return punts. He could catch out of the backfield. He could run. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer for a reason. You had Isaac Bruce and Torrey Holt. You had these guys that could do some great things. What do you do? If you went after Marshall Falk, you left Kurt Warner to do what he does. If you go after Kurt Warner, you left Marshall Falk to do what he does. What do you do? Titans did all right. I would say they did all right, considering the fact that they um, – considering the fact that they kept the, the Rams only to 23 points. But 414 yards, that's incredible. That's incredible. And by the way, when I was thinking of performances, I was thinking the best performance I ever saw was Prince in the Super Bowl halftime. But, you know, that's a little different story. Prince and uh, uh, even Katy Perry had a pretty good performance, too. Uh, that Justin Timberlake thing we could just forget about. Uh, but Prince probably had the best halftime performance. Of course, in my opinion, the best uh the best performance for the national anthem is Whitney Houston. Of course, she hit the nail on the head, how she sang it. And in the situation, she sang it right during the beginning of the uh, Gulf War. So that was absolutely beautiful. One of the performances that I do remember uh, most, and, and I even had the jersey at home, is Terrell Davis's performance in Super Bowl 32. Um, John Elway brought the Broncos pretty much by himself. He had some backup, obviously. You can't do it by yourself. But if you want to say, how did the Broncos make it to three Super Bowls in the 80s? Uh, it was John Elway. You know, then they he ran up against uh, the Giants and Phil Sims and what he did. He ran up against Timmy Smith and Doug Williams and what they did. And then he ended up against Joe Montana and Jerry Rice and what they did. But once the Broncos drafted Terrell Davis out of Georgia, and he got his start and started playing. They gave John Elway the key component that he was missing during the time that he was the, the starting quarterback for the Broncos. They gave him a running back that was consistent. In Super Bowl 32, he pretty much said that I'm not only consistent, but I'm one of the best players in the NFL. Listen to this. He had – 157 yards on the ground rushing with three touchdowns. But one of the biggest, and he won MVP and he, he deserved it too, but one of the biggest plays that he made was not even touching the ball. Uh, if you listen to a couple episodes ago with Kevin Bryant, Kevin Bryant talked about how the Broncos figured out a the, the down and distance from the end zone that the Green Bay Packers would blitz on. And they would blitz on it every time. And he, they basically told Terrell Davis that you have to be in the game and we're going to fake the ball to you. Terrell had a migraine. If you ever had a migraine, you know that you don't want to be touched or hit or talked to. It hurts. Mike Shanahan told him that we're going to fake the ball to you, but if you're not in there, they're not going to believe it. So what happened is Terrell Davis went out there, had the ball faked to him. They did a uh, – bootleg and John Elway ran the, ran the ball in. If Terrell Davis wasn't out there, they wouldn't have believed that. So he sacrificed his body and his head because, like I said, if you ever had a migraine, you know they're not fun to get their score. Terrell Davis became one of my favorite players at this point. Of course, I liked him before because he was a good player, uh, but at this point when I realized just what he put on this line, he not only became one of my favorite players, but became, a, a, to me, uh, a great speaker for us for those of us who have migraines and people who don't believe that they're real well terrell davis could tell you that they're absolutely real you go on and you look at some other great performances jack lambert in super bowl 14 even though the rams lost he had 14 tackles uh, excuse me jack lambert did not play for the rams excuse me i was thinking about somebody else the Steelers, he was playing for the Steelers. He had 14 tackles and an interception in the fourth quarter. Jack Lambert, if you ever w looked at some of the Steelers footage at that time, was one of the scariest looking dudes that you'll ever see in your life. 14 tackles. Good gracious. That's a that's 
a game and a half for most people. Jack Jeff Lambert did that. One of my favorite runs, though, in the NFL uh, Super Bowl history was in Super Bowl 18. Marcus Allen. Marcus Allen was one of the greatest running backs of all time. We don't always hear about him because, well, because the Raiders really didn't know what to do with him. Uh, they did him wrong. Al Davis did him wrong. Marcus Allen was a great runner and deserves all the credit that he had come in and, and did, did fun, did great. Bo Jackson was probably a better athlete, but Marcus Allen was probably a better pure runner than Bo Jackson was. In the Super Bowl, he uh, had a basically reversed – he got handed off, went to the left, reverse course – and ran 74 yards for a touchdown. It was a beautiful run. He had 191 yards in that game with two touchdowns. Marcus Allen was an amazing runner, and especially in Super Bowl third, uh, Super Bowl 18. And there's several more that I want that we can look at. Lynn Swan had four passes caught for 161 yards and six with a 64 yard touchdown. That game against the Cowboys, Super Bowl 10. If you ever watch it, it's almost like Lynn Swan could just fall gracefully and catch the ball. He could extend his body and look so graceful doing it. If you've ever fallen on ice, you know that you go down hard. Lynn Swan would kind of glide down. That's how great he was. Dallas couldn't do anything against that. I mean, Terry Bradshaw would basically throw the ball and know that Lynn Swan would catch it. And in that game, he caught uh, enough to help basically win the game. And, and, and again, on this Bleach, bleacherreport.com website that I'm looking at, they talk about uh, several more, but I want to look at Jerry Rice. Of course, Jerry Rice had a great game in Super Bowl 23. I remember this particular game because uh, Jerry Rice pretty much won the game for him. 11 catches for 215 yards. Uh, just a beautiful, beautifully played game against the Bengals. Uh, most people think that Jerry Rice caught the last, pass, uh, last touchdown of the game. It was John Taylor. John Taylor caught that crossing route. But Joe uh, Joe Montana to Jerry Rice in this Super Bowl, 11 catches for 215 yards. John Riggins had a great game. Joe Montana, as I mentioned a minute ago, against the Broncos in Super Bowl uh, 24, had 22 for 29 for 297 yards and five touchdowns. Let me repeat that again. 22 for 29 for 297 yards, five touchdowns touchdowns good night go back to super bowl 22 doug williams doug williams played on a hurt knee ended up throwing four touchdown passes 356 yards in the second quarter alone good night Good night. That was incredible. In that game, the Redskins, it says here, rolled up a Super Bowl record of 602 total yards. Broncos were a great team. The Redskins were that much better. One of the best games that we don't always think about, though, and I got two more, and I appreciate y'all's time today, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow with more Super Bowl highlights. It's Super Bowl 21. We don't really hear a lot about Phil Simms. Uh, when most people think about uh, the Giants, they don't think about Phil Simms. They think about Lawrence Taylor, as they probably should, and Harry Carson. In Super Bowl 21, the Phil Simms led uh, Giants won the game 39 20 to 20 against the Broncos. At the end of the day, Phil Simms fin uh, finished the day with 22 out of 25 for 268 yards and three touchdowns. He had the highest game percentage or highest percentage of passing in a Super Bowl with 88%. That is incredible. That is absolutely incredible. But probably the day that many of us remember the most, especially if you grew up in the time that I did, and that you remember the conflict between Joe Montana and Steve Young, who is the best, who is the greatest. In my opinion, uh, Joe Montana was a better passer and probably a better player, but all around runner, passer, player, it would have been Steve Young. Steve Young 
uh, had those abilities that Joe Montana really didn't have. Uh, not saying that Joe Montana was a bad player, but Steve Young had abilities that Joe Montana didn't have. And there was a conflict during the late 80s, early 90s of who will start the uh, at, for the uh, 49ers. And many people said, well, why in the world would you do anything but Joe Montana? Well, Steve Young had his chance. Steve Young had his chance at Super Bowl 29. He finally made it to the Super Bowl. You know, he got beat a couple times in the playoffs. But I want you to listen to this. In the Super Bowl against the Chargers, they won 49-26. to It was a blowout. It wasn't even that close. He completed 24 of 36 passes for 325 yards and a Super Bowl record six touchdown passes. He also rushed five times for 49 yards. Now, again, when we talk about the Super Bowl, it's a team effort. It absolutely is. But it's amazing to me that when you look at the team effort to get there, the cream, you know, as, uh, as what was it, Randy Savage says, the cream rises to the top. Your best players tend to play out the best on this great stage. I mean, there's several more people that I could have mentioned. Uh, you know, what happened with uh, Tom Brady against the Eagles and things like that. But these are some of the greatest players and the greatest performances in the Super Bowl. So when you watch this Super Bowl coming up Sunday, you're going to probably see a handful of players, probably on each team, start to perform at another level. It would not surprise me to see one of my favorite players, A.J. Brown, uh, have over 150 yards receiving. It just will not surprise me. Uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to see Patrick Mahomes throw for 400 yards, and Travis Kelsey to have three touchdowns. It wouldn't surprise me. All that being said, you don't want to rely on one person to, to win a game because what could happen if they get hurt. But you're going to see the best players in your team, if you're an Eagles fan or a Chiefs fan, really rise up to the occasion. Everybody is running for that ring. Everybody is gunning for that ring. You're going to see the best players rise up. Thank you, and I will see you next time on the Football's Family Podcast. And we have a new sponsor here at the Footballers Family Podcast. It's Manscaped. Support for the Footballers Family Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped re recently launched the Ultimate Men's Hygiene Bundle, the Performance Package. Join over 5 million men worldwide who trusted Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with code FAMILY at manscaped.com. The Performance Package 4.0 by Manscaped has arrived and, oh man, is it a game changer. Inside the package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver, Revival Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a Travel Bag to Hold Your Goodies. First off, the Lawnmower 4.0. This trimmer is the future of grooming, and I dare say the greatest ball trimmer ever. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The Lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof and it also has a 400K LED spotlight you need for a more precision shave. Because this trimmer is waterproof, you can say goodbye to the mess on the bathroom floor. And you thought that was good, but wait till you take your grooming game to another level. The Performance Package 4.0 includes the Weed Whacker nose and hair, ear hair trimmer. The Weed Whacker is also waterproof and provides proprietary safe skin technology, which help reduce nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate nose holes. The Crop Preserver Below the Waist Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Below the Waist Toner will change the way you approach your daily hygiene. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to the Performance Package 4.0. 
the Manscaped Boxers, and the Shed Travel Bag. Bring your comfort and boxers to another level. It's time to take care of yourself. Go to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping with code FAMILY. That's get 20% off and free shipping with code FAMILY at manscaped.com. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tool with Manscaped. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Join George Bozica, the president of the PFRA, and myself, John Bozica, each month for the Professional Football Researchers Association official podcast. We'll discuss the history of the game, the many names of the game, and so many different things for you, making the history of football not only entertaining, but fun at the same time, as we join you on the Sports History Network on the official PFRA podcast. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.